All right. I'll call, I'll call to order the February 5th special city council meeting. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is a continuation of the... Uh, council retreat um, that we had uh, not last Saturday but the Saturday before and uh, we wanted to give the chief an opportunity to finish his presentation and then uh, Tim Johnson to uh, elaborate uh, a little bit further on uh, economic development with that chief yeah good evening uh, mayor Farrell deputy mayor Honda uh, members of the council thank you for this opportunity to uh, finish uh, the presentation on uh, uh, crime and crime statistics and uh, I was told to maybe five minutes in terms of presentation. I have really two slides left, so I should be able to cover that and uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, reducing uh, violence. A uh, little focus on more on uh, gun violence here, but just reducing violence, crime in general. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, we are seeing a trend. You know, two years in a row, we've had uh, reduction in uh, gun-related crimes. So when you look at, you have some statistical information from uh, the council retreat presentation, but our overall, when you look at uh, firearm discharge or threats with a gun, overall uh, this year we're, we saw a 23% reduction in uh, gun-related crimes, which is a positive trend, and we had also had a reduction the year before. What I wanted to share with you, I told you uh, on the council retreat, uh, I made a statement about uh, maybe making policy decisions in the future or being able to answer any questions uh, from the public. I hope this information will be helpful uh, for you uh, in that respect. So one of the key things um, that relates to violence and crime is uh, uh, reducing our dependency on drugs. Uh, significant number of crimes have a nexus to uh, drugs. And our crime analyst um, reads every single police report. And she estimates that 80 to 90% of crime is related, somehow related to drugs. So if we can reduce uh, the dependency of drugs, it will have a huge impact in reducing gun violence and also crime in general. Uh, in the late, in the 80s and 90s, uh, cocaine, Crack cocaine was a huge problem. So when it comes to drug use, I think it's cyclical as well and violence. And back then, um, you know, we were seeing some of the highest homicide, homicide numbers in this country. And, you know, King County, Federal Way was no exception to that violence back then. It took a long time uh, for us to turn that ship around. And then uh, meth, methamphetamine came along in the labs and the problems that created in our uh, community, in our society. And now what we're seeing is uh, uh, pain uh, pills, uh, Oxycontin and so forth, really um, there was just too much distribution by corporate America and uh, it's really negatively impacted our community, our society, our nation. We have turned off the faucet in terms of the pain pills, so people turn to heroin, so which is coming up from the south so we're in the midst of dealing with this opioid epidemic so that is certainly uh, contributes to you know violence and crime so I wanted to share that with you if there's opportunities policy decisions to reduce uh, the drug usage um, that would certainly have a positive impact I know there's work being done at the federal level state level regional and here locally we have an, a detective signed to the regional task force on drugs we have our own uh, narcotics team that works on this issue, uh, but enforcement alone is not going to do it. We're going to have to 
reduce the dependency. We're going to have to get people off being addicted to heroin. It's going to take some time. I think the country recognizes it. This region recognizes it. We're working towards that. Second, I wanted to share with you is uh, influence on violence is uh, what people are being exposed to, particularly to young people. Um, celebrating and promoting violent culture in our movies, music, entertainment, video games, all these things have a negative impact on our young people. And as a result of this type of promotion, we have young people running, running around with guns at a higher rate than our society has seen probably in a long time. Uh, we saw this again in the 80s and 90s with crack cocaine, but we're seeing young people running around with guns. Kids are just exposed to too much violence and sometimes they act out on that. Um, the law enforcement, we only deal with the most extreme and advanced parts of the social issue. Uh, the police can't do it alone. And I recognize quite often the burden is on the police shoulder. And we have certainly an important role and we have to take enforcement. But uh, that is not going to be the only answer to dealing with violence. Next, I wanted to share with you that a high percentage of violent individuals grow up in abusive neglective households, lack of positive role models. Obviously, we work closely with the schools. Schools play an important role. We have to support our family. I don't really necessarily have an answer to that. This is a, a problem that's been going on for a long time. A lot of kids grow up uh, without positive role models, and, uh, and they're, they're quite often neglected. But that's a huge influence on crime and uh, safety of our community. The next item, uh, social economic factors um, influence crime. So whatever we can do, uh, I know community development, uh, I mean economic development plays an important role, policy decisions, but um, whatever we can do to increase uh, the in household income in our community will play a big role in uh, how we keep our uh, community safe. It isn't because uh, police department is doing such a fantastic job in Medina, they have a lower crime rate. You know, social uh, economic factors do matter. So whatever we can do to pick our citizens up, and that is a huge factor. And lastly, um, safe storage of firearms. Uh, too many firearms are being stolen. Too many firearms uh, are not being locked up. And you might think of what makes the news are, you know, violent crimes or criminal act or something very unusual. but Unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, young people, um, people that commit suicide uh, on a regular basis with firearm, uh, generally never make the evening news. But there's just too much violence with guns. Uh, we need to uh, do everything we can, support legislation or other things that encourages people to uh, lock up their firearm. Quite often, uh, people are losing their firearm in their vehicles or um, family members are accessing firearm in their home or sometimes home is burglarized, just specifically targeting because people know that they have firearm in that home. So I think that is a huge factor. So those are, these are just compiling some things that um, I believe that will, not just our community, but just society in general that's gonna make our uh, community um, safer. So I am, uh, that is really the conclusion of the police department presentation. I'd be willing to answer any questions that you might have. All right, uh, Council Member Sefa Dawson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. One thing I've always wondered is if I keep my, if I had a gun or guns, and if I keep them locked, how would I access them when I need them? There's uh, locking devices that you could purchase um, that you can it's keypad that you can open up very quickly or biometrics. So uh, you can, and also quite often it comes with a cable, so you can you know, latch it so that it can't, somebody can't just walk away, walk away with it. But if you need to access it middle of the night because there's a threat, you could quickly you know, access your firearm. But that type of locking device will keep <coughs> it out of other family members and uh, children. And if you practice, just like anything else, you should practice accessing your firearm. Uh, you can do it in a matter of seconds, from getting up from your bed, getting to the, the, the locking device and opening it. You can do it in a matter of seconds. But you should, uh, universal precaution, uh, you should never leave firearm just, you know, under a bed or in a, a dresser. 
that's a recipe for a disaster that could happen. So, and I think there's a recent incident just in a community north of us where a very small child accessed a firearm. I'm sure it was there for protection, but uh, unfortunately, mother was shot in the face. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of tragedies we want to avoid, so we want to encourage people to lock up. General rule is either the gun is on your person secure or it's locked up. That's generally uh, a safety rule that you should follow. Okay. Can I ask another one? Um, in, in the Seattle Times, um, there was um, um, records on, you know, all the crimes that are happening in, our, in the cities. Mm -hmm. And we ranked, I think, from the bottom, fourth. And then the other cities were also South King County cities that were ranked low. Do you have any information on that, or can you tell us what that's all about? Yeah, I think competitive, uh, comparative um, ranking will always be done um, for various reasons. When it comes to crime that should really be avoided, um, you're not comparing apples to apples when you start doing that. For example, that uh, ranking only listed, um, I believe, 71 cities. There are 281 cities in the state of Washington. There are cities nearby that was not even on the list. Um, I think the data said if you didn't provide complete information, they were not included. Um, in this country, only 40, less than 50 percent, I believe it's 43 percent of the countries use Nyberg reporting. Uh, we're a nationally accredited organization. We're to be nationally accredited, you have to report crimes in Nyberg which is 27, you have to report 27 crimes. There's still 57% of the police departments in this country that are using UCR reporting. That's nine crimes. I can tell you that they will always have lower crime than us, <laughs> agencies who use 27 crimes to report versus nine. So when people start looking at national averages or state averages, you're not comparing apples to apples. So that was very unfortunate, um, listing University place is the most dangerous city. I mean, that's the <laughs> most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Yeah, and um, then we're using, we, 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 actually, we're very fortunate that the uh, chief of staff uh, to the city of Auburn actually responded to the Seattle Times reporter on that because they used the statistics there from an alarm company that was told specifically, uh, and the, actually the FBI data that was used, there is an admonition to not use it for this purpose. It actually specifically says, don't do that. But and people are using it. Right. People are well, using it. So how do we educate the well, public? I think we, you know, the, one of the most difficult challenges we have as public policymakers is uh, addressing misinformation. And even the people immediately to our, the city of Auburn that responded on our, on our behalf doesn't use NIBRS. And they're, they weren't in the system. Actually, most of the cities in King County were not listed as the in the in the you know, however, 72 cities that were listed. Yeah. It was really unfortunate. Um, so that's the kind of misinformation that's really, that's really tr truly damaging. That ranking was compiled by a, a, an alarm company, alarms.com. And obviously they're trying to sell a product. And if they can generate fear and concern, and people are going to buy more alarm systems. So bottom line is the analysis was not, uh, uh, not accurate. And again, you know, 71 cities out of 281. Um, so there's a lot of cities that weren't even ranked. Mm -hmm. There was another one that recently came out that ranked five as the most dangerous city. Again, ridiculous um, that they would do that. Uh, it's, it has such a, a profound impact on communities. Yeah. But as a policy group, that's what I wanted to share with you, that when you look at these statistics, um, quite often they're not accurate. At the best way to compare statistics is uh, using the same method, uh, agency to agency, same agency year over year is the best way to do it. And I'm not going to tell you that uh, we don't have our challenges here in South King County. Uh, we have challenges here in, in uh, Federal Way. And I shared with you some of the challenges that we have just because where we're located. And we serve many other communities. So, um, but I hope that answers your question. I certainly don't think Federal Way is one of the most dangerous cities in the state of Washington. I don't think so either, but it's public. That's what the public is saying. Absolutely. They see that, and absent of any other information, they're going to say, what? see, see, I told you so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Councilmember Copang, Councilmember Duclo, Councilmember Johnson, and then did you? Okay. okay. I, then the Deputy Mayor. I appreciate Councilmember Sepa Dawson bringing up the, the, uh, that recent report. That was 
part of my question. I think uh, when we look at crime, though, we look at it both as a, a, as a hindrance to economic development and uh, just the general well-being and perceived well-being in the community. I think mm -hmm. that um, we have uh, a, a perception that gets reinforced by bad news. And uh, I, I, I don't know how this could be done, um, but as, as a council member, I certainly would like to see us not say um, we report at a higher level and we're not comparing apples to apples. Um, if there's a way for us to create a, a, some kind of a statistical reporting that allows us to be more comparative to um, another ju jurisdiction so that there is an apples for apples comparison, um, I, I'd be interested in seeing that. Um, I think regardless of how somebody's reporting crime, I know one of the things we've talked about is that there are some jurisdictions that don't report crimes under fifteen hundred dollars in, in monetary value. That's correct. Mm -hmm. We do. We report every crime here. So phone report, online, absolutely. we encourage we're so data driven. We so we, we don't we don't exclude crime from our reporting. Um, obviously sometimes crimes are underreported, but that's not exclusive to the federal way. That's not unique to us. It's, it happens in every jurisdiction. So I guess what I would like to do is be able to to look the citizens in the eye and say this statistic is not a reflection of the comparative value of either a community or a police department and be able to stand tall that and not just say well they're using different numbers. It sounds like a dodge. So I don't know how we could do this, but as one council member, I would like to see something done that kind of helps us to be able to tell a better story about ourselves as a city. One thing, um, you, you know, community of 97,000, almost 98,000 98, people. I mean, we had um, one gun-related homicide last year. You know, it was a manslaughter case. That's, you know, uh, we don't have that many years where we have that low of uh, homicide by gun violence. So I think that's something we should be proud of. I think mm -hmm. we suffer a perception issue because we're a much bigger city than we really are. Um, when people watch regional news and there's something that happened in unincorporated uh, east of Federal Way, they mentioned right. Federal Way. Well, sure. people who don't live in the area, exception of the policy group, you might get notification from me that, hey, this isn't in our city. But people hear Federal Way because it's Federal Way address, right. and people don't distinguish the difference if that's in the city or it's not in the city. So we're really, it's quite often a city of 130,000 people in right. terms of uh, Federal Way being mentioned in the news. So. We're not a small city. We're one of the bigger cities, and we're going to have incidents occur. Yeah. I think, again, I think that's a reality that I think all of us have come to accept. And I do agree with you that unincorporated King County um, sometimes does get reported as Federal Way. Um, I think there's people that live here that sometimes refer to that area as Federal Way still. So it, uh, I get it. Um, but uh, again, I just I don't know what that would look like, but I definitely would like to see us do something to maybe level the playing field perception wise with additional reporting that is in line with our surrounding cities. Okay. Thank now you. me. Please. Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the presentation and I really think this should be in the paper. I think what you've said and the statistics you've shown us, we should give to the paper so they can put it in there. And we should respond. May I? Uh, may I? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, there's a there's a rule of communications that you, res you should respond in the forum in, in which you were addressed, and so uh, was there would there be general consensus for us to respond to the Seattle Times and asking them to, you know, dovetail with the chief of staff? Well, she's the director of administration um, for the city of Auburn. She provided a great response, and I think I shared it with you guys, mm -hmm. um, you know, electronically. Uh, would you be willing, is that something you would like to see us respond in writing to the Seattle Times? Yeah, I would. Well, yeah. yeah. Right, Councilmember Moore, real quick, yeah. we've got to get to Councilmember Johnson and, and the Deputy And Board. I think, you know. Well, I haven't finished I, oh, when sure. you come I'm back I'm sorry, to me. that's right. No, I no, that's you. okay. Yeah. Do this first. This is in response to the yeah. mayor. Um, and that's, you know, and I think, you know, social media is a little bit underutilized still at the city of Federal Way. And, and that being said, I think that response we ought to put in our social media and saying, 
here's a response to an article that you might have seen. <coughs> uh, so just to add to that, I, I would add that to our social media to continue that dialogue publicly. Okay. Deputy Mayor. I mean, excuse me, uh, Council Mayor Duclos. <laughs> Sorry. I just got elevated. Sorry. Congratulations. <laughs> now, I also wanted to say that <clears throat> years ago, I did have a gun in my house. I also took training. I went over to Coma and um, took training on how to properly handle a gun, how to use it, and how to protect yourself. And then we did target practicing over there, too. And uh, that was one of probably the most helpful courses I'd ever taken. I don't have the gun anymore, but at the time, it was, it was something that I was enjoying doing because when I was a child, we had a lot of property and my grandfather had, had BB type guns to try to shoot away the, the birds and stuff from eating the crops they were growing. And so I wasn't afraid of guns, but I wanted to know how to use one properly and how to, how to keep it safe. And talking about keeping safe is getting a safe for it and having it bolted to the floor. But I had fun target practicing. That was a lot of fun. So I, I'm not against guns. I just, I just think that people who have them really have an obligation to learn how to properly use them, how to properly store them, and keep them out of the hands of criminals. Here, here. Councilor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chief, uh, thank you again for the presentation and all the stats and data. Um, as a green person, like Councilmember Tran here, um, really appreciate this, uh, this data. One of the things that I'm, I'm looking at is the, the drugs. So from 2016, 17, it looked like it jumped 225%. What do you kind of attribute that to in that particular year? And uh, what, what kind of, what did we do around that piece? Because it looks like that was a big jump. And then the second question I had was around um, kind of just looking into, there's a program in Burien that recently started um, called LEAD. Uh, law enforcement assisted diversion and have we looked into working with the prosecutor's office and, and case managers around something in that area to, to help folks that have like you said a lot there's a lot of repeat offenders in federal way uh, the same people that repeatedly are in the system and so is there is there something that we're doing to address that particular issue too okay so are you looking at the Nyberg numbers your yes. first part of the question and you say drugs I see drug narcotic offenses I see a reduction of 13 percent is there another item that you were looking at it's the fourth line up from the bottom it says VUCSA drugs and then it says in 2016 we had eight offenses and then in 2017 we had 26 okay are you look okay that's it's the it's the one. second handout that we had the Federway oh. Police Crime Stats. Okay, is that is that the homeless yes. yeah. stats? Okay. So sure, I, I think that's such a small number. I think you'll see a big jump. But you're really looking at oh I see from uh, sixteen to seventeen? And then uh, eight seventeen to eighteen, correct? Twenty three percent increase? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So I'm going to, uh, 2016, you see a big jump there, 26 arrests. But in 17 to 18, you're really looking at five, five more or six more, right? Yes, correct. So I don't know that that's a huge, I know it's when you're dealing with small numbers, that's a big jump percentage-wise. But in total number, I don't think that's a huge difference there. But I don't really have an answer for that. Um, Council Member Johnson, I, this is just crime statistics, small sample of just dealing with uh, the homeless population. If you go to the mm -hmm. Nyberg number, then you're looking at more of a bigger number uh, from 370 total to 323. So there's a reduction citywide in terms of, uh, you know, narcotic related arrest or drug related crime specific to that arena. But it, with the homeless population, you see a, certainly see an increase. But other than that, I, I don't really have an answer. I think a lot of our homeless population do have a, you know, addiction problem. And, uh, you know, earlier I was talking about dependency on drugs. It's kind of contributed to the, our homeless situation as well. So I hope that answers that question. And the second part, uh, you were talking about, are we working with the King County Juvenile Prosecutor's Office? I missed a little bit part of that or some particular subset of the 
program they might have there? Yeah, I'm, I think it's just the prosecutor's office. There's a program called called LEAD, which is Law Enforcement oh. Assisted Diversion, yes. um, that both Burien and Seattle have implemented. So I was just wondering if we've looked into um, a similar program or have we even have we looked into something like that that could address repeat offenders? Yeah, we are monitoring that, and we have been in com communication with the King County Prosecutor's Office. They're just now ready to expand to other cities at this point. It's I would look at it more of a pilot project, but they're they're definitely looking to expand. And when they do uh, come to South King County, we will certainly um, evaluate that and 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 most likely participate in that because one of the things is we want to get people off being the drug addiction. That's what's fueling some of the crime. So. Yes. Okay, great. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. I have some questions under gun violence. On page seven, there's total shots fired, and it has the month and the year. And then on page eight, it's gun violence, and it has threats with a gun. Can, what are the differences between those two? Columns. I'm going to get to the slides here first. Is okay. It, okay. Right here. This is this one of the slides that, here. That's the first one. Yes. Okay. So this slide here is uh, where we have situations where somebody's been shot, shots fired with injury, or a shot was fired but there's no injury. Okay. So in 2018, uh, we had total of 24 incidents of those, and then uh, next slide, just so somebody's produced a gun, and they're made threats. And uh, we had a total of 16 of these type of incidents, which was a reduction of 38%. Uh, when you combine those three statistics, then your overall reduction is 23%. You know, and that's where I mentioned that. So this is two years in a row we, we're seeing a reduction. And I know uh, you have some information on why we saw an uptick in violence in 2016. We've talked about that a lot. And we did dismantle uh, a gang that was operating primarily in uh, West Federal Way. So that has certainly played a contributive fact to reducing the number of gun-related violence over time. So I think we're on a positive trend. Obviously, uh, gun violence frightens people. We don't want any. Shouldn't happen at all, but it, and I gave you the reasons why it does, but we're constantly working towards reducing gun violence because it has such a profound impact in our community. We are continuing, uh, periodically continuing gun emphasis patrol Robbery, robbery prevention patrols. We are at times spending some overtime money to have a positive impact in some of our hot spots. We call hot spots that we're, there's propensity for more violence. So we put extra officers there at times. Okay, so um, now uh, another question on this. So let's, let's say uh, my husband and I hear gunshots fired on the trail and we call 911. Mm -hmm. In October of 17, October 31st of 2017, on Halloween, we called 911 twice. Mm -hmm. And I see that there's one under October of 2017. So what, and I, and in reading social media, mm -hmm. I hear uh, often, you know, people are saying gun, you know, I just heard gunshots, I called 911. So how does, um, how do you account for that? So you don't, I realize that when we called 911 on Halloween, mm -hmm. the two times, mm -hmm. that it was an incident report was filled out, not a police report. Mm -hmm. So um, what, if a citizen were to look at this and say, well, that doesn't make any sense because I hear gunshots more than once a month, you know. Sure. How, how would I explain this? So it would not necessarily be captured in these data, but if it's illegal discharge, because we get complaint, we get quite a few of illegal discharge, and quite often it's not firearm. It's sometimes it's confirmed it's fireworks. Sometimes you can't tell at all. But if we have an incident where we can verify that there was a shooting, like uh, we find casings or a house has been shot up, like drive-by shooting would be included in these data. But illegal discharge itself, if we can't verify something's been hit, uh, somebody's been injured, it wouldn't go into this particular data. So it would be, it would go down, it would be recorded as illegal discharge. If, if, if nothing is hit, no one's injured, it's not a drive-by shooting. So that's what these data, data captures. And the threats with the gun is 
you know, domestic violence type of call where somebody's produced a gun but they didn't fire. That's what it's capturing there. Okay. Um, and then children, there was a survey taken recently and of children in our school system and a large percentage of children reported not feeling very safe at school. As a city, that's something we need to work on. Uh, obviously, we don't have anything to do with making policy for the school district, but when parents come to us and say, you know, my child doesn't feel safe at school, and, you know, it's a city of federal way, what could we, is there anything we could do as a city council to help children, and even staff, staff were asked how, if they felt safe also, to help with that issue? You know, I haven't seen that statistic or okay. that survey I, I i would i would like to think that most children who attend school feel safe at school um, but i don't know what i don't know what that statistic is what we know is that we you know we partner uh, we take safety seriously we partner with the school district any threat that's that comes our way whether through the school or directly to us we we work on those cases extremely hard to prevent any potential violence we have five school resource officers in the school. School district has their own security force. So a lot of uh, work is done where we train with them on active shooter training. Last year, we trained all of their staff on uh, active shooter training, and then we're doing continual work uh, with the school uh, this year as well uh, for emergency response. So, but I, I don't know, I've read some material where I, I think kids have said they felt safe in their school, but I don't know what you're extracting that from. So, uh, but I'm sure there there are kids who don't feel safe in terms of bullying and things that are occurring. But it's 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 a continual work in progress. Okay, and um, I would like to add that, you know, our citizens do have a perception that crime has increased and not decreased. It's something we hear often, mm -hmm. and um, I would say if if my car was stolen or my house was robbed, or I would feel violated and it's happened to us we've had our car stolen um and I, I think we need to be sensitive to those citizens because it is an awful experience to go through something like that or to I, have their house broken into and um their things gone through and things taken so i know um you know i, I know the numbers and i i know that crime has been decreased but the perception is that it hasn't. Well, we still have crime. So another thing I want to share with you is that violence, when we're dealing with violence back in the 80s and 90s, we didn't have social media. People now get, even media, I mean, there's so much information out there, and you're exposed to it so much as a child and as an adult. I think it does create a perception that there's far more crime because you're, you have so much more information. And I think with the homeless population, it's so much more visible. When we became a city here, one of the priorities for uh, council then was to address prostitution that was occurring on Pack Highway. And we worked hard to eliminate what was visible that people were concerned about. Um, I can tell you right now there's far more human trafficking and prostitution that's going on today, but it's not occurring on the streets. You know, it's all on social media and they're meeting. It's on the internet, they're meeting at hotels, apartments. So what I'm telling you is that it's happening more often, but it's not visible. What's different now is that the homeless population is so visible, and they are committing certain level of crime, but overall crime as a city, you know, we're down. Auto theft is a real number. Uh, people always report auto theft. It's down. Homicide, generally, it's always reported. It's down. So I would just tell you that we're in a different environment now where people are inundated with information, so they think that a lot more is really happening when, in fact, uh, city might have less crime per capita than when we're in the 80s and 90s. Thank you. Councilor Tran. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief, thank you for your presentation. Um, I um, concur with um, everyone here that our city is not the, uh, the, un the most unsafe city uh, because uh, you know, several years ago, well, actually five, six years ago, we decided to move here uh, because we know it is safe to be in this city, and that's why we're here. Um, having said that, there's still a perception out there, especially in the social media, that uh, we have a lot of problem and issue. And I said per perception. 
So one of the things that, um, you know, I work for DSHS, and oftentimes you don't hear anything about DSH DSHS until something bad happened. Um, so many years ago, we decided that to, what can we do to counter that, inf you know, negative information? So we share a lot of the good things that we, we did and, you know, wonderful stories so that we can count, try to balance the, the media. So I was thinking, as a policy maker group, uh, maybe we should do that. We should, um, uh, the mayor office, for example, can issue you know, press releases uh, you know, on social media, on the, on the mayor, to, to tell the public that, hey, the things that you guys see on the Facebook or next door is not really true. So I was just thinking, you know, maybe we, we, we can do that. Councilmember Duclos, then Councilmember. Great, great minds think alike. Oh. Because I really think that we should have this information going into the paper as well as on our, our Facebook page and things like that. But I'd like to see it in the local paper, what you've reported and what the, how the crime statistics have gone down. I, I think people need to know that, so I think we should do all kinds of media about that. Um, the local paper, you know, take, take a page or, or whatever and, and send in the mayor's letter to the people and, and then put it on our Facebook page and, and um, just get people talking about it. Let it know that Federal used to have a terrible reputation. It doesn't, in my mind anymore, but when I first moved out here, I used to love coming down here because they're shopping center was much better than South Center. Uh, and when I lived up in Renton, I would come down here a lot. And I decided that I wanted to move to this community. I took a job down here. And I wanted to live and, live and work in this community because I thought it was such a nice, a nice city. So I think we need to do some promotional stuff about the city. And let's have the police um, do, do some, show some of these statistics, how it's dropped down. And what we're doing is working. We're, you know, we're no worse than anybody else, and we're better than some other places. I wanted to share with you, this is preliminary data. Um, it has to go through the state auditing process and also the FBI. So these numbers will change a little bit. And the official Nyberg numbers will come out uh, most likely in April, May. So I, I just want you to know that um, if numbers change, um, it's just preliminary numbers because we want to share it during a uh, council retreat. So I just want to share that with you as well. And to council uh, members, Trent, we, uh, in the police department, um, you know, with the resource that we have, we do um, try to find ways to communicate with our citizens, like on our Facebook, Twitter. I think we're doing that a lot more than we used to in the past, but I understand. Uh, I think the more positive outreach that we can do, we have uh, 8,000 followers. Uh, for the police department and uh, so I yeah I think that's a continual work in progress and we'll continue to work towards that and and I also uh, spoke with a uh, federal way uh, mere reporter on uh, council retreat and she did show some interest in uh, doing a story that I think they have a lot of credibility if they could uh, share some numbers and uh, kind of share what we're sharing what we're talking about now I think it would be helpful for the community because there's a lot of uh, citizens who aren't really following social media, uh, but they may see the news and it may garner, garner some regional news if the federal way mirror does a crime story. You know, we should really celebrate the fact that our crime is down 11 percent. And uh, but I'm going to tell you that we do have crime, we do have challenges, and it's cyclical, meaning I don't know what's going to trigger our crime to go up or down. Um, you might think the police department can control it all the time. If that was the case, uh, crime would never go up, right? But there's so many variables that I shared with you that impacts crime that we all have to work together to do. So I think I spoke more than five minutes. All right, Councilmember Moore. Thank you so much. Um, you know, Chief, I, I recall in our committee meetings uh, years uh, back, about I want to say two or three years ago, and we certainly talked about social media and, and the police department doing more things. Um, and um, I, I would completely wholeheartedly agree with you that you have definitely, um, as a leader of, the, of your departments, uh, I have seen an increased amount of times that the police department has used social media. Uh, and I think it's, it's a really important thing because, um, you know, we, we live in a period of time where people want information right on demand. 
uh, and social media meets that expectation of people. Um, and I think it's really important that uh, we utilize social media as a city uh, in, a, in a greater and a bigger capacity. Uh, but each department also uses Facebook as well because the more interaction you have, whether it's videos or interaction or stories or, or did you know type things, I think that helps the public understand what this is all about because let's just be real, the public doesn't really understand a lot of things that you would, we all know. Uh, and so uh, I think that's something that we need to cont continuously strive for um, you know, I know South Kane Fire and Rescue. I hate to talk about firefighters in your presence, Chief, but, um, you know, I know they do a fairly good job of utilizing social media and just giving little updates, you know, uh, little tidbits that are things that are happening. I think, um, you know, I think uh, continuous improvements, you know that model. Uh, there's always room for that. Um, sure. And uh, I would encourage you to do that uh, as much as possible. And really, as a city, I think we need to do more of that. Um, because I think that helps people not only understand, but be confident that um, of what's uh, what's coming out. You know, the fact that you just stated that we have to take our numbers and take them to the state for clarification, not clarification. They do an audit. Or, they do an audit. And so does to the do idea. an audit. I think that's great information for the public to understand that, you know. Uh, but my real question, Mr. Mayor, was, uh, Chief, um, uh, I know that in that um, slide uh, with the... Uh, January December 2017 versus January December 2018 in uh, NIBRS. Uh, I don't know. There you go. Um, the drugs, narcotic offenses. Um, obviously, in, in 2017 there was more than 2018, so there's a decrease. Um, do you guys drill these numbers out to be a little bit more specific and what this means? That's one of the reasons why we use NIPERS. There's a lot of data that you can extract uh -huh. from this information. That's why national accreditation requires us to do NIPERS. UCR reporting, you can't extract any data than what's just listed. But under each category, there's a lot of information we can draw from, from crime analysts and so forth. I don't want you to think that drug activity is down just because that's down. It really relates to proactive police work. Right. So if we're really busy with more calls for service in that given year and we don't have the resources, then, you know, it may look like we reduce in crime, but not necessarily so in some of these data. It's yeah, because I, I'd be curious, you know, of those of those numbers, uh, what is uh, specifically ecstasy or, or what is the pot, you know, drug, mm -hmm. uh, marijuana, you know, I'd like to get those detailed numbers uh, because obviously, uh, you know, we've talked about, um, and I'm kind of di diverting a little bit, but we've talked about, you know, whether or not having pot stores is, is okay here or not. And I think that number would be really informative and would help me at least in understanding that whole concept. So, okay. thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council, Council Mark, go back. I, just, uh, I wanted to just, I know we want to get to economic development, but I had, this is for the Council and the Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I think that we have relied in a large part on, on the, the federal mayor to report what's going on in the city. And, uh, but what I'm seeing now is that social media has become a reporting agency as well. And in a lot of respects operates, you know, in the best, with the best of intentions, but without necessarily the full complement of facts to guide their opinions. And I keep seeing this where a story will get run off the rails and will go a whole different direction based on hearsay. And in the process, we're doing damage control on right. something that's not even true. Right. Um, I think that, you know, we need to look very care very seriously at how we increase our social media presence and um, get ahead of stories by telling the good news ourselves and uh, really controlling or at least informing the news cycle with information. Um, we can't control it. People are still going to do what they want to do. But as far as informing uh, the, 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 the city and not relying on a weekly publication or Facebook updates that may or may not be true to uh, guide the perceptions of what's going on in the city. So I, I think that we really do need to look at getting ahead of this by being a lot more proactive in our social media presence. Well, I wanted to share with you, there will be a 
uh, Seattle Times got a hold of us. We're not the only agency, but I think they got a hold of a lot of agencies, and they're going to be doing a crime story. So I want to let you know that um, our, some of our data will be highlighted in probably upcoming Seattle Times article. I don't know when it's coming out, but we were contacted for some information. But we'll be compared with other jurisdictions, but that's forthcoming. Yeah, and I think uh, that's very well stated, Councilmember Cope, and I think that's um, it really just uh, we're seeing great statistics or improved statistics on public safety, but this kind of comes down to communication as a whole for the city of Fedaway. And um, and I think that, you know, there's also emails. I think we finally have started utilizing our email program through Constant Contact. I think that's a great tool. That's another great resource. Paper uh, is good for people that are not technologically savvy. Uh, and you know, I, and I, I mean, I'd like to look at, um, and obviously in consultation with your office, Mayor. Uh, but you know, communication uh, where we have text messages, you know, a whole systematic approach uh, to this, so that way we can get in front of issues or, or challenges or information or good stories to share. Because uh, I think last year, the, the biggest thing I take away with is, I feel like we were in a reaction mode a good portion of the time last year and I think if, if we can work uh, by advising uh, you and, and uh, you know if Tyler your communication person uh, can build a systematic approach I think uh, that would really be a huge positive thing not just for the police department but for all <coughs> sorts of avenues uh, and, and it helps for transparency and that's how we build confidence in and our uh, and our bosses so to speak the people fed away thank you thank you <clears throat> thank you chief Thank okay, you. Uh, moving on to economic development. Uh, Tim? Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. Um, before I get started, just quickly a couple different things. Um, first, uh, something I didn't get to talk to you about at the retreat. I want you to all visualize right now where the former Azteca restaurant was on 317th and 23rd. 317th and 23rd. The average price of property right now in our downtown is selling for $34 to $35 a square foot. That piece of property, because of its proximity to where the transit's uh, future light rail station will be at, is now selling for $100 a square foot. So the piece of property on 23rd at 317th across the street where the proposed uh, light rail station will be located is now selling for a hundred dollars a square foot is sound transit buying part of that property uh, only a very small portion of it is that what they're paying for it i can't tell you that because okay. i don't know and we're not privy to a private piece of property uh sale you're talking about the former azteca site that's correct yeah that's what it's listed for yeah yeah and they're not okay. going to sell it for anything less than that in my okay. conversations with them um, so be prepared for changing uh, business marketplace second thing <clears throat> Macy's uh, two weeks ago announced multiple store closures in our state you notice how ours was not and as the mayor and I both know and being informed by Macy's is that our store is an excellent store in the regards of internet sales. And I heard a couple of you talk about uh, where you shop. And one of the things you need to be aware of is the fact that <clears throat> people, no matter where they live in South Puget Sound, are more inclined to shop, come and pick up their internet sales at the Federal Way Macy's store because of the easy um, ability of getting in and getting out of it other than uh, the, the mall in uh, Tequila or the mall in, in, uh, in Tacoma. So <clears throat> where the Macy's store, the other Macy's stores are at. So I think it bodes well. I think it, it's extremely uh, informative and it's one of the elements that I will constantly be using and selling Federal Way in the future on because our ability to get people in and out of our community is far easier than others. Um, you may have a rumor out there I want to put a kibosh to it. There has been a sale, another sale of one of our hotels, Richard Song, 
um, has sold a Comfort Inn. Um, I do not have a price on it, and I don't have enough background to make it worth your time this evening of who the buyer is. As soon as I get a chance to talk to Richard further, um, I was in contact with him last week because issues associated with homelessness on the adjacent property to his on uh, PSC property that was being resolved and has been resolved, but that was what my initial contact with Richard was. And then we had a subsequent very short conversations about the sale, and we, we are, uh, we'll get together this week to talk about that. As I learn more, I will forward it to you. Late last week, I contacted you about an inquiry that came from uh, the State Department of Commerce on a, a major uh, company. Um, they were disseminating a request for proposal to multiple jurisdictions throughout the Puget Sound to respond to a office end user who is requiring a very large, large sum of square foot, feet, uh, square footage. Um, <clears throat> the requirement was to have it delivered today and all that corresponding information that was completed and taken care of so if you if as I know more information I will provide that to you um, it is an office end user I could tell you that and it was related to information technology and the building that was submitted was the former corporate headquarters building at IRG campus quickly want to go through uh, the next 90 days and this this is a clock that's already started it started on January the 2nd um, I've been working on a Port of Seattle grant that I've had um, for the last two years this would be the third year uh, I just need time to finish it uh, I'm getting pulled so many different directions on so many different projects I told you about this in the uh, process of our budget in, in October uh, I need to get through it and I need to get through it quickly if you don't if you wonder where I'm at it was like this weekend in order to get that project done and to respond to that uh, inquiry I worked 23 hours over the weekend for the city to do that and I appreciate all of you calling and, and offering your assistance uh, but it that's a significant effort and uh, this will be the third weekend in a row I've worked for you all and it's it's I got to get this grant done because there's money behind it. There's good money behind it. Um, the hotelers um, and, and information that you have received, we have an off season. It's November through January. Um, they're asking us to use, and it is was approved by you in in the uh, in the budget for an off season tourism analysis to figure out ways to increase our sales tax receipts and improve uh, the economy of federal way from November through January um, we're working on that there also is a tourism economic baseline study that we're working on too as well um, hope to have those both done and completed um, later this year I hope to have the baseline study done uh, in June the off-season tourism analysis may go through the fall we have major contracts. We signed one again with the Small Business Development Center at Highline College to provide assistance to our small businesses. Um, I think that's significant in, in that um, we, we're running out of space for small businesses, physical, physical facility space. It's hard to find rental space right now in federal way for small business, very hard. And we don't have any new development on the site uh, coming on in the pipeline. For small business right now so that's going to be a, it's going to be a tough one um, outside of you know picking up nails and hammers and you know building it ourselves I don't know what else to do under the circumstances um, we have a contract that we continue working with the Chamber of Commerce we have a really great program with them on our hospitality education <coughs> tourism training program we deployed a program last year, you know, before those big three uh, tourism events that we had. You recall the Underwater Global, uh, under, uh, Global Underwater International Robotics Competition, the National uh, Olympic Special Olympic Games, and uh, the Young Ladies uh, National uh, Fast Pitch uh, Tournament. And <clears throat> what we learned from that experience was that was a face-to-face -face training program. It required a tremendous amount of work. And what's come out of it is a focus of development of an online program. 
so that it's easier um, deployed that way. So we're working on that with the chamber. That will be deployed uh, later in 2019. Uh, of course, you got the community opportunity analysis on light rail and the, and the state legislation in support of that. Uh, this year um, is the first year for the new market tax credit annual report for the Performing Arts and Events Center. It has to be done by May fir March 1st. And so that's the reason I say I got a lot of paperwork on it, and, and a day's never done one before, and so I've got to work through staff on that. Our tourism promotion area, which will bring four to 500,000 new dollars to the city, needs to get initiated, um, and we'll try to do that before the end of March. A couple key items here, the Northwest um, Collegiate um, Conference Championships and the Pac-12 Championships are this month. The Northwest Conference is this week. Let's hope it doesn't get snowed out. Um, I am hiring in the process of three interns. I have one on board now. I should have had one on Monday, but because of the snow, that didn't happen. So hopefully that starts tomorrow and then one the following week. And we continue to respond to a very high level of business inquiries in our community, um, more than what um, I think one person can take, but that's it. I'll take right. any questions. Council, any questions? Keep up the great work. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, if you had a crystal ball, what do you think the our mall, the, the, the commons, will look like in five to ten years? <coughs> five years, you probably see the vacancy at Sears uh, filled and probably a relocation of the Red, Lo uh, the Red Robin in Azteca. Um, I don't expect to see much more than that um, as the mayor and I have been class uh, gone to class on what's happening with sound transit as it relates to the mall he can explain this but there's a series of dynamic issues that that play and one of them that we all know is the covenances that Target has with that mall and the requirements that they can lay on th their future existence the longevity of their lease um, and how they can push back on sound transit so the, the, the concern is that alignment with that track. And when they can figure that out, and they're going to have to figure it out here pretty quick, we're all going to be witness to this over the next six months, then I think we can see a better, we can have a better uh, uh, crystal ball uh, vision. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what happens uh, beyond that. I think their interest <clears throat> is increased density on that property. 33% uh, is impacted by the, the BPA uh, high intensity power lines. So there's not a whole lot that they can do with that unless we get very creative. And in, in, quite honestly, as a policy uh, direction, I would ask you to get really thinking outside of the box. I know that this will make all of you uncomfortable. But I think this is something worthy of exploration, and that is the bearing of the high intensity lines from I-5 to Celebration Park into a power sink or an energy sink. And in that regard, when you place those high intensity lines into a sink, it creates energy. And from that energy, um, you can heat uh, water. That water then can become steam and can be used, metered by the Bonneville Power Administration in a, um, let's say, a pilot project that can be used uh, to power <coughs> Federal Way in its future growth. And that way you can get those power lines down as an eyesore and blight to the community, but also allow uh, increased density into your downtown, creating increased tax base. And I think that's something that you ought to have a, a serious conversation at. Um, these conversations have gone on before, not in our state, but I ask you to look at Las Vegas. Most of the high intensity lines that were there are now buried because of the very reasons of the hotels needing to be there. And so they have enormous heat sinks throughout that city, and it's, I think it's something that we need to take into consideration. May I remind you that another city that is impacted equally as bad is Renton. And, Mayor, you can talk about that because you worked in Renton for, for years. And so I think it's worthy of our time and effort spent, um, particularly with our senators, U.S. senators, to have that conversation. 
That's where I do call it in the deputy mayor. Uh, now, I've raised this issue uh, for quite some time, but when Sound Transit comes in, they're going to be moving some of our businesses. And what are we going to do to try to keep those businesses in federal way? Well, in my outreach to these, uh, again, the, the two key businesses um, apparently are being, the ones that, I, that concern me the most are the banks or the credit union. Those are being handled and being relocated, and, and so we won't see disintermediation in uh, financial or monetary disintermediation in our community. The will they stay the here in out. federal way? Or They'll stay here in federal okay, way. Okay, that's, that's my concern. Those two will stay in federal way. I'm not sure where Denny's going yet in ARCO. Of course, ARCO just opened up a new facility here, so um, they, may, they may look at that as a, a wash. Uh, I don't know where Wendy's is going. I'm trying to deal with the national... Um, headquarters and I'm not getting far on that one um, the the the, uh, the stores and businesses in, in the mall uh, or the, the 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 shopping center itself uh, all of them are kind of all uh, in uh, different places right now in their terms of their negotiations and what they're looking for it is difficult because we have so very little um, <coughs> vacancy left the, I, and I'll be real honest with you. Uh, I think I told you this at our retreat. The, the large grocery store chain, Sprouts, is actively building six stores in the Puget Sound re, uh, region. They came in and spoke with the mayor and I. Uh, they, they've tried to get into the mall. They're working on trying to get into the mall. Um, they've worked with other property owners like Jordan Snitzer. Um, and it's difficult because they have a very large uh, uh, square footage requirement. Um, we just have more if, if let me just conclude by saying this I know that you hear and this is something that's fascinating to me you hear on on social media that there is no demand for retail storefronts quite the contrary right now I can I can name at least six that are trying to get into federal way right now and the smallest requirement out of that six is 25,000 square feet the largest is 150. Wow. Yeah. So it's really difficult to serve these people until we get new construction underway. It's a great place to be in, but it's really tenuous for me. I, while I still have all my hair, you notice what color it's changed over the last four years that I've worked for you. But it's, it really is about dominoes falling into place or the puzzle <coughs> fall. Uh, coming into focus in regard to what sound what sound transit takes when they slice off that section on the east side of their parking lot and it depends on what target wants to do and then from there the series of dominoes will fall in regard to what happens from there but anyway that's what's going on uh, deputy mayor thank you so I have two questions now um, and they're, they're both regarding sound transit so sound transit has talked about bearing the high power lines i have i have asked that question of staff that i know and unless mr walsh knows anything different i have not heard of anything um that was an idea thrown out at one of the community open houses by the by a couple community members to look at the span where the train goes through um whether or not it needs to be raised or undergrounded um, so sound transit got that feedback from some of our citizens um, they did look at it and are still in the process of looking at it. It'll be part of the EIS, but I don't, they're pretty confident that they can either get under them as they exist today or, or nominally impact them by keeping the towers and, and tightening the tension on the wires, which will lift the mid-span without undergrounding them. But yes, that, well, that is a comment that was received by Sound Transit from the community. Okay. And they are looking at it. And my second question is more of, kind of amazement that the Target Corporation could be telling Sound Transit what they want instead of Sound Transit telling them what they want. So is that is that actually happening? Sound Transit is well, going to let Target? I think it's a matter, may I? You sure. I, I think it's a matter of, it's not about anybody telling anybody anything. Mer Mer Merlongire or Jameis, uh, the new owner, has expressed his has expressed the position it's a contract issue with regard to target and their parking in the in the rights that they have 
Jameis uh, is very concerned about what Target could possibly do. And so they have rights under the contract. So it's just a matter of, of, of you know, working out how much is the take, where do they, where do they exit that property? Is it, do they cut off, is it just a kind of a straight line on the back, you know, on the, you know that, that far side, that far east side of that parking lot? Or do they, do they slice off immediately south of, it just depends how much they take and what options target, legal options target wants to pursue. So it's just a matter of positioning at this point and position and posi uh, bargaining positioning or position bargaining. Well, I, I find it fascinating because usually it's a, the other way around. Well, and I think that, you know, Sound Transit's attempting to be accommodating. And I, you know, and I, uh, and maybe EJ could speak to this as well. I mean, I think that part of this comes down to just engineering. And part of it will come down to, you know, it, what is the most economical way to get back onto the, you know, to mm -hmm. get alongside the freeway. But we're also presupposing that that's the route they're going to take to get down to 348. That's the most logical one, considering where they're at now. But I think really right now it just comes down to what's feasible engineering-wise. And, and uh, so I think these decisions are really yet to be made. Okay. And then my last comment is, when we talk about economic development, it seems like we're always talking about either the IRG property or the downtown area. But we have Federal Way's quite large uh, land-wise, and we have neighborhoods that could be developed like Twin Lakes or uh, up around 272nd. Are we doing anything to increase economic development in other areas other than just downtown? And is there anything that council could do? Well, one of the things on Twin Lakes, you could finish the uh, the community plan requirement on that. That was never never completed, um, and hence the reason why you probably got that public storage facility out there rather than something else that the mayor and I had worked on. You know, where that site was at, we were working with the <laughs> property owners from California to get the re retailer in there, uh, Wilco, and. Uh, we just could never ever get the, uh, the that conveyed to the property owner through the broker. And if we had had that that completed, that that land use issue completed, we probably would be in better shape right now than than having that public storage area there. A um, couple new businesses have moved into to uh, the Twin Lakes area, so it's it's pretty healthy out there right now. Uh, you got some more that are going to open up, but, but there's not much space out there. As you know, we worked diligently to fill the space, the gro empty grocery store on 356th and uh, 21st Hong Kong Market several years ago. They have bought that and, and have uh, made some changes on that, uh, that facility and will continue to be making changes, positive directions there. Um, as it relates to 272nd, we've had several property owners approach us they're going through a variety of different market analysis right now on uh, development. Um, we're kind of at th their beck and call because it's their property and their analysis. Um, so they know what their property is owned at. And if they come back with new commercial development, it'll be something that we'll have to address when we see it. But until that time, I mean, we don't have it in a redevelopment area per se. As it relates to uh, military and um, 288, um, we're constantly looking at that and trying to uh, bolster those businesses there and try to get other businesses out there. I think that area will be the future growth of some of the over uh, uh, some of the smaller businesses that will be impacted by the dislocation caused by light rail. And that's a, that's a good location for some of those out there. And so I think they'll probably head that direction. Okay, Councilmember uh, Duclo and then Councilmember Sepa Yeah, I can't, re I can't remember the street name, but um, m when you're going down towards Tacoma, but up closer where all the stores are down there, um, you have Costco and you have all of those places down there. How is the Sound Transit going to, are they going to interfere with those businesses? I heard at one point in time they were talking about they were going to run the rail lines 
behind the businesses, between the I-5 and the businesses. Well, Dini, may I, may I uh, Whoever. since I'm, I'm chair, co-chair yeah. of the elected leaders group of the S, of the TDLE, the, the uh, Tacoma Dome Link Extension, I co-chair it with uh, Mayor Woodards of Tacoma. Um, so right now they've got a number of different options. Number one, when they come down alongside the freeway, it's, it's one of probably about three or four options. The first, the first option uh, that doesn't look as favored as it used to is the Jet Chevrolet site. Okay, that's one. That's right alongside the freeway. But that's really difficult to get to for people on the east side, and it's a really jammed up area. Another location is where the current across the street from the Home Depot and the Costco at that industrial factory, right, that cement factory right there, uh, just to the north of the U-Haul. That would unfortunately have the uh, probably have the effect of taking out the U-Haul. It would take out that business. But the benefit of that is 352nd would allow people to come and go from that area and disperse from the area. The other location, the, the other location at that area is across the street where the Costco gas station is. That's another location. And I would say the fourth. Um, I don't know if I've lost track here, but I think that's three. The fourth would be where the Burger King is on Pacific Highway and. Um, and 348 so it would swing all the way out there now that seems like it would you, you know the benefit to that is for people coming you know from the residential areas of federal way and and probably some you know possible economic development there the problem with that is it's right next to the high bus and it's a big it's a long ways away from the freeway so there are all kinds of pros and cons and and when we have uh, we're, we're going to have some transit come on the 19th their focus will be the OMF, the Operations and Maintenance Facility, but we can get another briefing on this process right now because those are essentially the four narrowed down sites. You. Oh, you're welcome. And there's pros and cons with every one of them. But the idea is this is going to come in in an elevated fashion and then it's going to get back on. Um, so we've got Council Member, oh, uh, Council Member uh, uh, Sepidawson's first. Okay. Okay. Council Member Sepidawson and Council Member Kopech. Um, this could be community development or economic development, but I think we should look at um, increasing, and I don't know what the, what the zoning um, is for downtown area. Thinking 50 years from now, I think we need more um, maybe upzoning. Is that something we're even looking at, or is that something we should even start studying? I don't know. I'm, it's just something I would think we should consider if we're not already. Yeah, the city center core uh, zone does allow a pretty liberal uh, height uh, allowance. I don't know what off the top of my head, uh, but to go even higher, it's certainly something that we could look at. But right now, the the allowance to go uh, vertical is is pretty generous. So let me ask one other thing. That's the, the the direction that the council gave on the state legislative agenda to look at the opportunities associated with what light rail creates for us. I think we'll we will put that in part of our scope of work so that you have an indication of what that might look like. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Copang, and then the Deputy Mayor. Councilmember Sefa Dawson, that's the second time. That's good. We're obviously on the same page tonight. Um, I do think I what I like about this particular conversation is it's different from some of the conversations that we've spent a lot of time and energy on, and that's what is, um, whether it's crime, or homelessness, or uh, you know any other a number of things that are right in front of us uh, and are important subjects but what will be I think is is very important for us to have a conversation about now because if we don't direct by our planning and by our foresight what the city will be it'll become something we don't necessarily want um, so I think uh, you know Councilmember Duclo has has talked numerous times about you know the loss of revenue and the need for transit order development and understanding and I think all of us I mean I have I've heard this consistently from all of us but one of the things that I really want to do in our council retreat is really begin a more robust conversation as a council on uh, on what will be um, and how we can shape that by decisions that we make today um, and, and council our deputy mayor Honda said that is a conversation that she wants to have in the future and possibly in a second retreat. Um, so I certainly am looking forward to that. But I think that uh, for us as a council um, 
to be we need to be as I think equally obsessive about what the future of our city is going to be as we are about what it is right now I think we need to do we need to look at both and I think if, if I could say this um, and I hope this is not taken negatively but I think that we've tilted more toward what is and I think we really need to, to, to level the playing field and really begin to talk about what can be more so and really create a future for the kids in high school now that want to come back to Federal Way or, or work and live in Federal Way. Um, the people that are here now and want better opportunities. And I think those that, I mean, this is something that would have a positive impact on every citizen in Federal Way on some level. So I think it's a very important conversation for us to have. And I think it's one that we need to enter in more robustly than we have to date. Can I add? Sure. And I think to add to that, I, we've talked about maybe having a second um, retreat. And when we do that, we can address this very heavily and, and dig deeper. But also, that could inform our legislative agenda um, for next year. And, you know, in September, um, January, I think then we'll have more um, will be more prepared to address that so um, just in support of having a second retreat this year would be great okay All right, thank you. we just have to rearrange some money in our council budget to to be able to do that but we could do it um, so I don't ha necessarily have any questions left but I do have a couple statements one is that I've heard that there's a plan for downtown um, I think you said that there's a plan for downtown I'm not sure what that plan is, but I would love to have the process that we went through as a city when the Twin Lakes plan came up. I wasn't on council then, I was running for council, but this room was full of citizens and there were tables all over and boards all over and ideas went out and, and a plan came up after several months of work. But downtown, you know, it's, it's almost a, I don't want to say an empty slate right now, but we have the ability to shape downtown into something different than what it is right now. And I would love to see the citizens involved in that as to what it is that they would like to see. And actually, and let the people know what downtown is, you know, what, what defines our downtown. And maybe that might be extended or maybe um, condensed, I don't know. And then the second thing is, when we talk about economic development, a lot of times you're talking about businesses. I, I mean, retail and restaurants coming in, but we also need businesses in here. And I know you're working on that, but we need businesses with well-paying jobs. And so did you, you remember the list that I gave you at the I, retreat? Yes, okay. I do. I have that. That's quite a bit. In fact, you know, Newmeyer Engineering, four years of working to make that happen four years of going and talking with them and pleading and begging and telling them how great federal way is which isn't difficult for me to do but it's four years and i know you want it sooner than that well i think we all do but um it takes a plan you know when when renton started developing their area i uh, can't for the life of me think of what it's called right now over by the boeing area mm -hmm. it, it was a 20-year plan Things don't happen overnight, but they had a plan. They had what they needed to do tax-wise to, to get to where they were, and, and it worked. I mean, it's, a, it's bringing in a lot of business, retail, restaurants. Um, it, it's done a really good thing for the city of Renton. So, but it was a, a long plan, but they, they had a plan. And um, I guess my next question is, I do have a question. When you told us about the business wanting a lot of space that you worked on all weekend and thank you for doing that did irg had the state contacted irg it, since it's their building that was in, uh, possibly being used so, um the great thing about it is is that um, we meet with irg what is it once tw is it every friday so on friday <clears throat> uh irg's representative dana austinson was here I immediately informed him of that because I received it on on Thursday evening and I then immediately contacted you folks shortly thereafter I knew that I was meeting with Dana on Friday at 9 a.m. 
he had received an email, but he had been out of the office, and so he had not seen that email. That and so we connected the dots, and so we started working on Friday evening and worked through the weekend together via phone, and put the whole thing together. Of course, yesterday was kind of a lost day, but they were behind me in the work that I was preparing for the city, and. By the time, let's see, I got, it, I got everything I needed to get completed today from uh, the state of Washington, WorkSource Washington, on uh, labor uh, employment incentives. Got those all to Dana, and then he packaged up the real estate side of the thing and, and then got it to them this evening. So I'm very pleased at how all this has come together. Um, you know, this is about our third or fourth one that we've done. I know we're running over time. I can explain a whole lot more at, at greater detail about what we've learned from these experiences and how this one, I think, is far superior in our presentation than we've ever done before. Okay. So I'm, I'm looking Thank forward you. to this. I think this one will, will shake out in our favor. Thank you very much. All right, Council. Oh, Councilor Johnson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tim, thanks again for the presentation. I think last at the retreat, you talked in the redevelopment bucket around the Heinz development. I was wondering if, if you could just give us a quick update on where we are with that. And then also, secondly, I'm still very much interested in the steering committee around economic development you mentioned. So um, whatever we can do to you know, get some next steps on the schedule for that, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on that. Again, so just to re uh, for re purpose of recall, I've, I've asked if I could meet with you all as a component or subcomponent of FEDRAC um, every 90 days, and 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 get uh, and report back to you, and you can Q and do Q and A, and we we can stay up to date on all that's going on and know all rumor control and share everything that's going on. Second element on, on the Heinz development, I, I'm, I'm going to defer to Brian on this one, uh, Brian Davis, Community Development Director, but um, they're in a comp plan amendment. They will be headed towards a zone change. They have a couple requirements that they have to engage in, and one of those is to hire a traffic engineer to work with both community development and public works, WASH, WADOT, and um, Federal Highway uh, uh, Administration. So there's a lot of work to do on that. Um, they're interfacing with Sound Transit. Um, and the mayor uh, spoke with the principal last week of Heinz Development. Um, and I have stated, uh, since the day that he made the initial orientation to you, he promised me that he would be writing you on a quarterly basis. I, 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 I call him monthly and bug him saying, look, I've given you the addresses and contact names for all our mayor and city council. I said, you said you were going to deliver that so they could stay up to date of what's going on. Okay. Apparently, you haven't received anything as of the date. So I'm going to keep bugging them, uh, the Heinz Development Group, until they do. There's a Councilor Duclo. Uh, please, just when you want to come to FEDRAC, just let me and or a day or both of us know, and we'll put you right on the agenda. So, yeah, well, this would be separate from a, a subcomponent of it because you're so busy handling finance and budget issues that you're so tired by the time I get to you at the very we end. We can special, we can actually, we can, we can set a separate one for you. Okay. 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 All right. Great. Any other questions? Tim, great job. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now uh, we've got uh, executive session. Pursuant to uh, 40, RCW 4230-1101-I, and uh, I would say uh, uh, anticipated length of executive session would be 30 minutes. Uh, we are in recess for that purpose.